Hi, everyone, and welcome to Engineering 210 Recitation. Throughout these first few weeks, we're going to just be working on some problems to help prepare you for the quiz. These are real former quiz problems, so make sure that you're paying attention as we go through uh, and taking a look at some of the, the strategies that we're using so that you can use them for your own circuit solving techniques. Okay, so I wanna go through and I wanna solve this problem, which is problem one. For the circuit shown below, calculate the power associated with a one amp current source. Assume that the circuit is a viable ideal circuit. Okay, so when we go through and take a look at the circuit, we need to find the power, which is the given by current times voltage. Well, we know that this particular source has a current passing through it of one amp. It's a one amp source, but we don't know the voltage. So we need to find some way to solve for that particular voltage. Well, what we can do is we can utilize well, we can utilize KVL, Kirchhoff's voltage law, pretty simple. So we know that there's going to be uh, a, a loop that we can see that includes that one amp current source. Well, let's go ahead through and calculate our, our KVL, which KVL, just to remind you, is the principle that says that the voltage drop around a loop must all add to zero. Or voltage drops and voltage gains added together must equal zero. Okay, so we know for a fact that we're going to have some sort of a voltage drop across our seven ohm resistor, V7, plus, now we know that we're going to have a voltage drop across our 12 ohm resistor. We don't know which way it's going to be. I have defined the current that passes through the 12 ohm resistor in this particular direction, which means that when we're going back in the opposite direction, when we're going in the clockwise direction around this upper loop, we're actually seeing a voltage gain, right? Because this is the polarity. So we're kind of taking a look at it as though we were traveling that way through the resistor. And if that is the case, then this is actually going to be a, a negative V12. We don't know what that voltage is either. We're going to have to solve for that later. And then finally, we're going to have plus, well, again, the current is flowing into the positive terminal of this device and out the negative terminal. So we don't necessarily know what that voltage either. So we're going to call it the volt voltage across the one amp is equal to zero. So we've got three voltages that we need to solve for. Well, luckily, one of them we already know, and that is V7. So V7, we know that V equals IR. Well, we know that the current that's flowing through the seven ohm resistor is simply going to be seven ohms times one amp is just equal to seven volts. So we know that seven volts is, is V7. Now V12 is going to be a little bit more challenging. So let's actually perform KCL and let's perform KCL at node one. So we know that we have three amps flowing into the node. Now I'm going to define anything flowing into the node as negative and anything flowing out as positive. So we have three amps coming in. We have a volt or a current, which I'll call I12 that is leaving my, so remember leaving is positive plus I12. We have one amp that's leaving from that one amp source. And we also have I8 that's leaving, which we don't really know what I8 is yet. So we'll, we'll just add that as a positive, that it's leaving the node. We don't know if it's leaving. It could be leaving. It could be coming in. But we'll call that leaving. And we'll say that that's all equal to zero. Remember, if our signs come out negative, then that just means that we guessed the wrong direction. So we have just rearranging. I12 plus I8 is equal to two amps. Now, how are we gonna solve for this? Well, we can do KVL again in order to find V8. Remember, V8, if we have that, is going to allow us to solve for I8 because we have Ohm's law. So KVL, we have a volt, 18 volt gain, which remember in our passive sign convention is negative, plus a 
drop across the resistor, which we'll call V2 to, uh, for the 2 ohm, plus the V drop across the 8 ohm resistor is equal to 0. We can represent V2 using Ohm's law, which is 3 amps times 2 ohms is equal to 6 volts. So that means that V8 is now going to be equal to 12 volts. If that's the case, then we know that 12 volts is going to be equal to our I times R, so current times R, which is 8 ohms, which gives us 1.5 amps as current. Okay, so 1.5 amps is going to be I8. Now we can solve for I12. So we can plug that back up into here, which means that I12 is now going to be half of an amp, which means that we can solve for V12. V12 is simply going to be equal to 12 ohms times 0.5 amps, which gives us 6 volts, which now means that we can go up and we can solve our initial equation. 7, which means 7 volts, minus 6 volts plus V1 amp is equal to 0. V1 amp is equal to negative 1 volts. We finish this off by applying our power equation, which is simply equal to negative 1 volts times the 1 amp that the, the source is supplying is equal to negative 1 watt. And now we've just solved for the power associated with the 1 amp current source. Okay, let's keep going with another problem. So the next problem is going to ask us to use some source transformations. Now, when we're using source transformations, remember that you cannot incorporate the resistor of interest into any source transformation. So we cannot incorporate this resistor into any source transformations. If we do, then it's going to change the way that that resistor behaves. So we cannot do it. If we have one particular resistor that we're interested in, we cannot incorporate it into any transforms. So remember that I can take this particular setup and I can transform it to a current source and a resistor in parallel. And the way that I do that is by applying Ohm's law. So my new source is going to be equal to my Ohm's law solution for 24 volts is equal to, remember Vs is equal to ISR. So 24 volts divided by 6 ohms is going to be equal to 4 amps is equal to my, whoops, wrote the wrong representation there, Is is equal to Is. So now I can rewrite my circuit. The polarity of the current source is always in the same direction as the polarity of the voltage source was. I now can put my two resistors in parallel. Okay, so now I have four elements that are all in parallel. I have a seven amp current source that's in parallel with a 12 ohm resistor, that's in parallel with a six ohm resistor, which is in parallel with a four amp source. Now, remember, 
current sources that are in parallel can be added together, meaning that I can actually add these two together. Even though they're, right not, they're not right next to each other, they actually I, can be added together because they're still in parallel. Remember, this is all one big node. This is all one big node. So I can actually add those together and I can get a current source that is now a value three amps because remember, they're going the opposite direction. and simplify my circuit down immensely. Okay. So now I have a significantly simplified circuit. I can simplify these two resistors, which are in parallel with one another using the R1 times R2 divided by R1 plus R2 formula which gives me six times 12, 72, divided by 12 plus six, which is 18. And then I'm simply going to be left with now two, rather three resistors and a single source, which is going to allow me to do a pretty easy solving. my new circuit looks like this. Three amps, a four ohm resistor, a two ohm resistor, and an 18 ohm resistor. This is another source transformation begging to happen. Remember, this is now a current source in series, or in parallel rather, with a, a resistor, therefore I can do another transform. IS is equal to VS divided by R, Ohm's law. Three amps is equal to VS divided by four ohms, which is 12 volts. All of a sudden, I have now a relatively simple circuit doesn't really matter where we put the resistor. I can still combine these two resistors. Remember, like I said, it doesn't really matter where I put it. They're all in series. Now I just have a voltage divider, or I just have a circuit that has two particular um, resistors in series, okay? Now the voltage divider, this is something that we took a look at in the lab, is simply equal to the value of the resistor that I wanna find the voltage across, divided by the total amount of resistance in the circuit, which is just equal to 18 plus six, times the total amount of voltage that is across that uh, particular, those particular elements. All of that is equal to now nine volts across the 18 ohm resistor, I can use my power equation, P equals V squared divided by R, which is simply equal to nine squared divided by 18, which is simply equal to nine divided by two or four and a half watts. And that's my solution. Okay, that's all for problem number two. Okay, so for problem three, we actually don't even necessarily have to do much algebra here at all. It simply requires us to know how to apply the node voltage method. So remember, the node voltage method is actually taken from KVL.
So we're just finding ways to represent voltage drops across different elements in order for us to take a look at the current that is going to be flowing out of a particular node. So for example, we know that Ohm's law gives us a representation for current. We know that V equals IR, and so I is equal to V divided by R. It's really that simple. And so we can represent all of the currents that are flowing out of different nodes via this expression. Now, remember, we're interested in this current, which means that we need to find an element, namely a resistor, that is going to be able to give us the relationship that is Ohm's law. So we have to be very careful about how we write our equations. So this particular, excuse me, this particular problem only asks us to write the equations, and we've already identified our three nodes at which we're going to write our equations, V1, V2, and V3. So let's write our equation about V1. So when I write my equations, I write all of my currents flowing out of the node as positive, which means that I always assume that my voltage at the node that I'm analyzing is the highest voltage in the circuit. You can do something else, you can do the opposite as me, but, but that is the convention that I typically utilize. So about V1, so I'm going to have V1 minus 50 volts divided by 5 ohms. That's going to be the current that I represent here. Now, if you take a look at that, the, by the way, all of you can just ignore all of the arrows that are drawn on this circuit. I'm not going to be necessarily using those. Okay, like I said, I'm going to assume all of my currents are flowing out of the node. Now, what I'm saying is that I'm saying that this V1 is the high side current between that and this 50 volt source. Remember the 50 volt source is tied directly to ground. So I know that I have 50 volts right at the outset of that source. So I'm saying V1 minus 50 divided by five ohms is a representation of the current that is flowing out of this node, the current that's flowing out directly down. Now that might end up turning out to be a negative number, but it, it doesn't matter. I'm representing it as a way out of the node plus V1 minus V2, remember, I'm saying that all of, that my V1 is the highest voltage in the circuit, whatever node I'm at, that is the highest voltage at the circuit, plus V1 minus V3 over 15 ohms. All of those are equal to zero. Now I have three currents that are flowing out of my node, and I was just able to represent all three of those currents, okay? about V2. This one's a lot trickier. Let's start with the easy ones though. So I have three amps that's flowing out of my node because I have that source there, so I can write that right from the get-go. Similarly, I can write my equation that I wrote just in the last equation, uh, V2 minus V1 over 2.5 ohms. Remember, like I said, whatever node I'm at, I'm assuming all of the current is flowing out of that node. Then as long as I'm consistent, I can keep that going. So I'm, I'm being consistent. So I'm saying that now the current is flowing out of the node. That's my assumption. This last component is really tricky. This last component of the expression, the current that's flowing out of the V2 in this particular direction is very, very tricky. Remember, I am analyzing this particular resistor. So I need to find the voltage drop across that resistor. The voltage drop is whatever the voltage is here minus the voltage here. So I know the voltage on the low side of the resistor is V3. But the voltage on the high side of the resistor, there's this source here that adds 10 volts to that voltage before I get to V2, which means that the voltage on this side of the resistor is actually V2 minus 10 volts. That's the voltage on this side of the resistor minus V3 divided by 10 ohms is equal to zero. Now I have to do the same thing about V3, 
I'm going to erase some of my markings so that you can see what's going on here. At about V3, well, remember, V3 minus the voltage on the other side of the resistor, which is V2 minus 10, divided by the value of that resistor, plus V3 minus V1 divided by 15 ohms, plus V3 minus, now we've got that same trick again. Remember, we've got our ground here. If we work back up through this particular source, it's in the backwards direction, this voltage is now negative 25 volts. So now we've got V3 minus a negative 25 volts divided by five ohms, and that is all equal to zero. How many unknowns do we have? V1, V2, and V3. We have three equations, which means that we are all set to go. So the last problem that we're gonna take a look at for this particular recitation is one that takes a look at mesh current. So mesh current method, remember, is derived from actually the loop rule. Even though it's called mesh current, it is derived from Kirchhoff's voltage law, meaning that we're trying to find ways to represent the voltage drops around particular loops of the circuit using resistors, using V equals IR, okay? So in order to do that, we define three arbitrary mesh currents, I1, I2, and I3, okay? Remember, any time that we go around our loop and we encounter a voltage drop, it's going to be positive, and any time we encounter a voltage gain, it's going to be negative. So about I1. About this loop, we're going to start with our voltage source. That is a voltage gain, meaning we have negative one volt, which is the value of that particular element. Whoops. Seem to have lost my pen here. There we go. Negative one volt plus, how do we represent the voltage drop across the two ohm resistor? Well, it's two ohms times current I1. Now, how do we represent the voltage drop across the four ohm resistor? Well, it's already been given to us. It's Vx and all of that together equals zero. Now, about I2. I always assume that the current in the loop that I am looking at is bigger than any other currents in the circuit. Just like in the node voltage method, I assumed that the voltage that I was looking at is bigger than any other voltage in the circuit. I am assuming that any mesh current that I take a look at is bigger than any, any other current in the circuit. As long as I do that consistently, it is a valid assumption. So I have to make it consistent, but I can do it. So that's going to apply in just one minute. So we're gonna start with the three ohm resistor. So how do we represent that voltage drop? It's simply three ohms times I2. Minus, now this is our loop here. Look at that one ohm resistor. Not only does it have current contribution from I2, but it also has current contribution from I3. And remember, like I said, I'm assuming that my current is going to be, the, whichever loop that I'm looking at is going to be the biggest current in the circuit. That's my assumption. So if I want this one ohm resistor to have a current drop, I have to assume that the current is flowing in this direction. Well, I have, I2 flowing in this direction, and I have I3 flowing in this direction, which means if I want there to be a current drop, I have to assume that the I2 is bigger than I3 when I'm going around I2. Now I have a dependent current, or a dependent voltage source rather, and that's going to be actually a voltage drop because we're going into the positive terminal and out the negative terminal. So that's 3Vx 
And then we have a voltage gain across the resistor because we're assuming that the current is going in the opposite direction of Vx. So minus Vx is equal to zero. About I3. So now I'm going to erase my marks so that we can take a look. Now I'm assuming that I3 is the biggest current in the circuit. So I'm going to start at the 3Vx source. So now I'm going into the negative terminal and out of the positive terminal. So that's a voltage gain. Plus 1 ohms. Remember, I'm always assuming that the current that I am looking at is going to be bigger than any other current in the circuit, which means that if I want the voltage drop now to be represented in this direction, it's got to be I3 minus I2. Finally, we have 2 ohms times I3 is equal to zero. Now, how do we represent Vx? Well, Vx is the voltage drop across this resistor. What is the current through that resistor? The current through that resistor, if we're assuming the current is flowing into the positive terminal and out the negative terminal, is I1 minus I2, which means that Vx, we have a dependent source equation, is simply going to be equal to the value of that resistor times I1 minus I2. We now have four equations and four unknowns, which means that we are good to go and we can solve the system of equations.